pastors here at Central United Methodist, and it is a blessing and an honor to get to worship with you all this morning. Thanks for joining us on this warm and balmy Sunday, but I'm told don't get used to it. It's going to change again here in a couple of minutes, as is typical for South Dakota weather. You'll notice inside your bulletins a couple of inserts, and if you're like me, you probably dropped half of them coming in, but keep sliding out. Human Relations Day envelope. In the United Methodist Church, there are six Sundays every year that we receive a special offering that we pool with every other United Methodist Church in the nation. Because we believe when we do ministry together, we can do it better. And so not only will we receive this offering today, not only Parkview, but churches all across the Dakotas and all across the country. And the Human Relations Day offering will go to at-risk youth and other social justice programs. If you didn't bring your, an extra check for this one this week, it's okay. You can bring your envelope home or put it in over the next couple of weeks. We'll keep receiving them. Also, you'll notice a nice brightly colored insert. We're having an all-ages family fun game night at the end of the month. You can read more about that or talk to Christy if you've got more questions. And on the flip side of that, you'll see a Bible study for Beth Moore that's going to be coming up as well. Pastor DeVern and Jim Dahl will be co-teaching a study on Galatians. And if you're interested about that, there are blue sheets on the Welcome Center down the bottom of the steps that will give you more details about that. Also wanted to uh, lift up that Melissa has one person who has stepped up to say that uh, they'll go with the youth on Friday night and Saturday. So... Thank you for that. He was here earlier. But we could use one more just for safety's sake. If you're being called to go and be with our youth as they gather with other United Methodists from around the conference in Brookings, talk to Melissa after the service today and she can give you more details. There are lots of other opportunities and announcements that are in the bulletin here. But for now, I want to encourage you to stand and to greet one another with the peace of Jesus Christ. Please greet your neighbor. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. It's so good to see all of you here. I'm glad to be here, and I'm ready to worship. Um, I'm gonna. I, I think the birds are. I'm declaring winter over because the birds were singing everywhere this morning, so they think it's done. I'm gonna go along with that. Don't pay any attention to the man waving his hands on TV. So, <laughs> I'd like to start this time with a word for dear Father God. We come humbly today as the glad receivers of your love, your mercy, and your grace. There's absolutely nobody like you, and we want to worship you. Worship you in spirit and truth as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. We thank you, and we praise you for who you are and what you've done. You deserve all the honor, all the glory, and all the praise. We acknowledge your presence in this place and in us as believers. In Jesus' name we pray.
today is Ephesians 3.19. I ask that you'll know the love of Christ that is beyond knowledge so that you will be filled entirely with the fullness of God. One more time. I ask that you'll know the love of Christ that is beyond measure so that you will be filled entirely with the fullness of God. That's a deep verse there.
Father. Glory and honor to your name. We seek you. We seek your will and your kingdom growing in us. We're here to give you thanks and praise. We thank you for your word. We lift up your name above all other names because your name Oh, some of you do. 
Would that get your attention if somebody all of a sudden said, Hey, you guys! It would, wouldn't it? Well, when I used to work at camp, we also had another way to try to get people's attention. Can all of you help me with this? I want you to turn and talk to your neighbor. Just start talking about the weather or anything else. Start making noise. But you gotta be louder than that. Okay. Now. Sound of my voice, clap your hands 20 times as fast as you can. <laughs> Did you notice the difference? One of them was yelling, and the other was being very, very soft and quiet. Which one helps you to listen better? School teachers, which one helps kids to listen better? Quiet. They're soft and quiet. So here's my question for you. When God wants to talk to us, do you think God typically is yelling, hey, you guys? Or do you think God usually talks to us in whispers and nudges? Whispers and nudges. That's been my experience. I have heard God speak a couple of times in my life, and it's always been this soft whisper, this gentle quiet. Now, let me ask you, why couldn't they hear me when I first started saying, hear the sound of my voice, clap your hands once. Because they were talking, right? If you're talking, can you be listening? No. Possibly, maybe you ought to. Not me. I can't talk and listen at the same time. You can ask my family, they'll tell you. Because I tend to talk a lot. Yeah, well, that's another thing. We guys don't do two things at once very well at all. We're not good multitaskers, but that's, that's another point. For this, we can't listen if we're too busy talking, right? So here's my question. When we pray to God and we spend all that time just talking, when does God get a word in? Never. That's what I want to challenge you to do this week. When you pray with your families, when you pray at bedtime, when you pray at your meals, I want you to leave some space, some space for silence where you are actively listening for God. You think you can do that? Maybe? All right, pray with me. Dear God, thank you for prayer, for the Holy Spirit, and for silence. Help us to listen to what you are saying to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks. You guys have a great week. The 8.30 service is somewhat accustomed to, to this. We don't get to do this much at the 11 o'clock. But I want to ask you to join with me as we do perhaps one of the most ancient traditions of the church. It predates the church, actually. The ancient Jews did this long before Jesus came in the flesh. And that is to pray the psalm, to use it as our prayer. So I want to invite you to join with me in the scripture lesson this morning by praying this responsibly. I'll say a piece, and then you as a congregation will respond. Let us pray. I waited patiently for the Lord who inclined to me and heard my cry. The Lord raised me up from the desolate pit, out of the mighty God, set my feet on the rock, making my steps secure. The Lord put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Many will see and be in awe and put their trust in the Lord. Blessed are those who make the Lord their trust, who do not turn to the proud, to those who go astray after false gods. O Lord my God, we have multiplied your wondrous seeds and your thoughts towards us. None Were I to proclaim
plain and tell of them, they would be more than can be numbered. Sacrifice is offering do not desire, but you have given me burnt offering and sin offering you have not required. Then I said, Lord, I come in the role of the Lord that it is written on me. I delight to do your will, O oh my God. Your law is within my heart. I have told the glad news of deliverance in the great congregation. Oh, I have not restrained my lips as a single I have not hid your saving help within my heart. I have spoken of your faithfulness and your salvation. I have, I have not concealed your steadfast love and faithfulness from the great congregation. O Lord, do not withhold your mercy from me. Let your steadfast love and faithfulness ever preserve me. And all God's people said, you know, as United Methodists, we often bear the brunt of the joke among evangelicals. It's common to hear people from other Christian traditions say, well, pff, you can believe anything and be United Methodist. And some might look at us here at Central and say that we're an example of that. And I'll tell you why. Take a look around right now. And don't look at me. Look at each other. Do you see? We're not just EUBs anymore. We're not just Methodists anymore. But right here among us, we're Presbyterians and Episcopalians. We're Lutherans and Baptists. We're Mennonites. And we are Pentecostals. And we are Roman Catholics. Right here at Central, those of us who call this our faith home, we're a pretty fairly healthy cross-section nowadays of all the different faith traditions that populate this part of the Midwest. And yes, while there are some divergent opinions among us on many topics, there is one that unites us. There is one word that draws us together with the triune God and with one another. And that word is grace. Grace. Paul declared to the church at Ephesus, for you have been saved by grace through faith. And this is not your own doing, but it is the gift of God so that no one may boast. As United Methodists, the concept of grace is central to what we believe about God. That our sin is great. Oh, but God's grace is even greater. Grace is central to what we believe about salvation. Now, I have an illustration here that I use with my confirmation students to help them understand what we believe about grace. How many confirmation students recognize what I'm about to do here? None. <laughs> Darn it. <laughs> I was like that at both other services. I need to do this more. Okay. Well, here's what I do. We're not playing duck, duck, goose here. I invite the students to circle up their chairs, and then they all have to climb into the middle. Ah, now I'm seeing some nods. They all have to climb into the middle and pile in and sit on the floor. This is the pit, I tell them. It is the pit of despair. Don't even, <coughs> Don't even think about trying this skin. A couple of princess bride fans. And in this pit, I tell them, it's pitch black. You can't see anything. You can't hear anything. The only thing that you are aware of is that other people keep rubbing you over. They keep hitting you and bumping into you and hurting you, looking out only for themselves. And it's at this point I ask all the kids in the middle for a volunteer to play God. And as you can imagine, among confirmation students, every hand goes up. Everyone wants to have the almighty power. Everyone wants to be master of the universe until I remind them that the job description includes being crucified on a cross, which generally greatly thins out the number of volunteers I get. But some brave kid usually keep their hand up. And then I instruct the God actor to stand up on one of the chairs above all their peers and to reach for them, just like this. 
And it's at this point that I say, freeze. And I say, you see that hand that's reaching out? You see that hand that is reaching down? That is God's prevenient grace. That grace that is always reaching out to us, to everyone on the planet, without exception. The grace that comes before anything we ever know about God. The grace that comes before any light or sound. That hand that is always extended to us, no matter how bad we've been, no matter how far we've strayed, no matter how many people we have hurt in that pit, God is always reaching for us. And then I pick another volunteer in the pit, and I say, okay, now, reach up and take a hold of God's hand. And once their hands have clasped, I yell at them again, freeze! Now look at those hands that are clasped together. When we respond to God's prevenient grace, when we say, Lord, I cannot get out of this pit alone. I need your help. I know I don't deserve it, but Lord, help me. When we accept God's grace as the only means to our salvation, that is justifying grace. Now I want you to notice at that point that we grab God's hand, that we're justified, we're not holy. We're not righteous. We haven't been made clean. But God says, I am moving you from that unrighteous column to the righteous column, simply because you have said, I believe. Help my unbelief. But God's grace also requires a response from us. And so at this point, I tell the God actor to help the respondee all the way out of the pit, lift her out, let her climb out, and then she gets to stand up on the chair next to God. And it's then I say, now you can see. Remember in the pit, you couldn't see or hear anything. Now you can see. And you look down at yourself, and you're filthy. You're covered with soot and grime and slime from the pit. If you want an image of that, think of Dick Van Dyke and Mary Poppins as the chimney sweep, or maybe this little guy here. And it's at this point that the respondee has a choice. Either stay up in the light, stay connected with God, letting God slowly clean those spots, ever so slowly removing the stains of desire and temptation and sin, or jump headlong back into the pit, bumping and bruising and hurting one another in the darkness. Two choices. By the power of grace, stay and let God begin that long, slow, wax-on, wax-off process that we call sanctification. Or by the power of sin, go back to darkness and hurt. Now that lifetime process of letting God clean us, that sanctification process, that's what Paul was saying to the Philippians when he said, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. You see, it's not our doing. We simply can't stop ourselves from sinning because we will it. We can't stop doing those things that are corrosive and damaging to our relationship with God and with others. We are powerless on our own to do any good whatsoever. It's a heresy known as Pelagianism, to think that we can just will ourselves to do good and be good in this life. We need God's sanctifying grace to stop doing the things we hate and to keep doing the things that God loves. Now here's what I want you to do. I want you to listen again with new ears as I read the first few lines of that psalm we just prayed again. Remember the pit of despair. Remember prevenient grace, justifying grace, sanctifying grace, as I read this to you. The psalmist declares, I put all my hope in the Lord. God leaned down to me. The Lord listened to my cry for help. And God lifted me out of the pit of death, out of the mud and the filth, and God set my feet on solid rock. God steadied my legs, and the Almighty put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise for our God. Did you hear? 
Provenient grace, justifying grace, sanctifying grace. As United Methodists, this is what we believe it means to be saved. It is not about what we do. It is all about what God has chosen to do in and through Jesus Christ. Now, it's important that we remember, this is not just an escalator where you get to step on a provenient grace and you just hang on for the ride all the way up. God's grace requires a response. If we refuse to respond to God's grace in this life, it's what Dietrich Bonhoeffer called cheap grace. It's useless. It's worthless. God's grace requires a response from us. So how do we do that? How do we respond? How do we stay connected to God? How do we stay in relationship? Not just stay in relationship, but grow in relationship with God. Well, there are certain practices that we can observe that put us right smack dab in the middle of God's grace. There are certain ways we can respond to God that allows God's grace to just flow over us like a cascade pouring over us. John Wesley called these things the means of grace, but I kind of like my friend Dan Lindholm's term. He calls it the pipeline. The pipeline. This place where we can get to, where we can feel God's grace just washing over us. Not by our own power, but by the power of God's grace. How can we enter into deeper relationship with God? And how can we find ourselves in the middle of that pipeline? That's what I'm going to be talking about over the next six weeks in sermons. But today I want to begin with prayer. Prayer is the practice of regularly communicating with God. Now, last week, if you were here during the 8.30 of the 11th, you would have seen the Dakota Wesleyan University students teaching our children one model of prayer called the five-finger prayer. Do you remember that? The thumb, the one that's closest to us, reminds us to pray for our loved ones, the ones that are close to us. The index finger reminds us to pray for those who point us to God, our Sunday school teachers, our worship leaders, our pastors. That middle finger, the tallest finger, reminds us to pray for our leaders. President, Congress. The part they didn't tell you, I also use that middle finger to remind me to pray for the people I don't like. You can read between the lines. <laughs> the ring finger. The ring finger is the weakest of fingers. I understand piano players say that's the hardest finger. I know it's true on guitar. We are pray for those who are weak in our society for those who need strength and need help. And then lastly, the pinky finger. We leave ourselves for last, the least of these. Now there's other models of prayer, like some people use the acronym ACTS, A-C-T-S. A for adoration, or I love you, God. C for confession, or I'm sorry, God. T for thanksgiving, thank you, God. Or... S for supplication, another big fancy Christian word. All it means is lifting others in prayer, people who need prayer. There's a million models and theories about how best to structure our prayer, but there's one that has always stuck with me, and it's come from a contest contemporary Christian author. Her name is Anne Lamont. She tends to be a little crass, so if you're sensitive to language, you might want to avoid her books. But if you don't mind strong language. She sometimes has some good insights. And she learned to pray not through seminary coursework. She learned to pray through the school of addiction recovery. She needed to learn how to pray. And Miss Lamont says that when you boil it all down, there really are only three prayers told. Help. Thanks. And wow. Help, thanks, and wow. And you know, we can find all three of these in today's psalm. The psalmist cries to God for help. My wrongdoings have caught up with me. I can't see a thing. There's more of them than hairs on my head, and my courage leaves me. Favor me, Lord, and deliver me. Lord, come quickly and help me. Help. The 
psalmist offers thanks and praise. You, Lord my God, you've done so many things. Your wonderful deeds and your plans for us, no one can compare with you. If I were to proclaim and talk about all of them, they would be too numerous to count. Thank you, Lord. And then what? Have you ever prayed a wow prayer? Let me ask you in a different way. Have you ever seen the incredible expanse of the Grand Canyon? Have you ever been mesmerized by the northern lights of the majestic mountains of Alaska? Have you ever been snorkeling among the rainbow-colored fish and coral reefs of Hawaii or the Pacific Southeast? Have you ever seen a sight so beautiful of God's artwork and nature that it left you speechless, simply watching and listening? Wow. In verse 6 of today's psalm, we read, Lord, you don't relish sacrifices or offerings. You don't require entirely burned offerings. You don't require compensation offerings. All of that stuff. You don't want it. But you have given me ears. You have given me ears. Now the Hebrew here very literally says, Lord, you have dug for me ears, like a shovel and digging in the ground. You have dug for me ears. And if you think about it for just a moment, it might become clear what the psalmist is saying here. Out of a pit of despair, where we are blind and deaf, by the power of grace, God has raised us into new life with and through Jesus Christ. God has pierced the darkness with the shining light of Jesus. God has broken through the grave of our deafness in sin by the resurrection of Christ. And God calls us to listen to the Spirit's whispers and nudging in our lives when we hear the voice of God responding. Wow. And so, my dear friends, that's, that's what I want for us this week, this year at Central Church, that each of us will be God's called people, placing ourselves in the middle of God's pipeline of grace by making time in our busy and everyday schedules to communicate with God, speaking, yes, but maybe even more importantly, listening. Listening to the ways that God wants to use us to be a blessing to our families, the ways that God wants to use us to be a blessing for our friends and our coworkers and our community. And so may God once more Break through our deafness, giving us new ears to listen for all the ways that God wants to use us to be a blessing. May we be blessed so that we can be a blessing. We pray for you. And I'd like to invite the worship team to come forward as we pray. Holy and awesome God, we give you thanks. For the blessing of prayer and the blessing of your grace, Lord God, by your grace, give us the strength to pray. We give you thanks for the Holy Spirit who will intercede for us when we don't pray as we ought and we don't even know how to pray. But Lord God, we ask for your grace and strength to help us to listen. That through you, we might hear our calling in this life and be used by you to be that conduit of grace for others. We ask it in the name of our Savior and Lord Jesus the Christ. Amen. And amen. I'd like to invite our ushers to come forward to receive our morning tithes and offerings.
strengthened by God's grace to pray. Not only to pray with our own words, but to pray through listening. Asking God to speak to us. Asking God to lead us into tomorrow. Go forth. Love and serve the Lord. Lord, peace. Love and serve you. Amen.